All right, so keep your place here in 1 Corinthians 13. We'll be coming back to it. Flip back, if you would, to Revelation chapter 2. I should say flip forward to Revelation chapter 2. We are continuing going through the seven churches of Revelation, so we are on Thyatira tonight. Revelation chapter 2, and starting in verse number 18 is where we're going to get our passage on this church. The Bible reads in Revelation 2, 18, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not done, excuse me, as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works in the end to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. So that is the, the letter to the church in Thyatira. We'll be going over this now a little bit more uh, closely and in depth in Revelation 2, um, verse number 18, of course, starts off with kind of more of a physical description of the Son of God. Here it says his, eye, his eyes are like a flame of fire, his feet are like fine brass. I'm not going to focus on that. There, obviously, the, the physical appearance is referenced in other places. I want to focus more just on the works of the church though tonight, so we're going to kind of skip past that. Verse number 19 says, I know thy works, like it starts off with every church. I know that works. This is in charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. So uh, it sounds like this church is doing a lot. And, 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 and Jesus is really giving them a lot of credit for the works that they're doing. The last works are even more than the first. And they have really good attributes here as well. So even though the majority of the letter is focused on the problem, is focused on some, some wickedness, some, some bad things that are going on in the church. I don't want to take, I, I don't want to skip past the good stuff because this, the, the good stuff that they have here is actually really good. And to me, it's kind of interesting how churches can have a lot of really good things, but oftentimes it just takes one major problem or a couple of things that, that can make God extremely angry and, and be willing to just remove the candlestick over because those things are serious. Those are not little things. I'm not trying to understate it. It's just, you know, charity, service, faith, patience are all very good attributes and they're very good characteristics and uh, fruits of the Spirit, right? So as a Spirit-filled church, obviously, I mean, they're all, all the churches have to be in order to be legitimate churches anyways. They're full of saved believers, you know, and they have some really good attributes. And that first one, charity, I want to spend a little bit of time. I could preach the entire sermon just on charity. It's, it's a great subject. We started in 1 Corinthians 13. Let's, let's go back to that. But just so we understand, you know, how important it is for a church to have charity, you know, the Bible explains a lot about charity, of course, in 1 Corinthians 13 and a few other passages as well. But um, this, is, this is a really... This gets to the heart of the works that you do. And we're going to see that in 1 Corinthians 13, that you could be doing a whole bunch of works. You could be putting forth a lot of effort. And if the charity isn't in it, if you don't have the proper love and the proper care into what you're doing, then it's basically all for nothing. It's just vanity at that point. And, and all the works that normally would be good works, if you had the charity in it, it's just kind of like whatever. So charity has to do with where your heart is. Okay, and, it's, and it's, it's the proper love that you need to have. 
And, you know, I preach on this subject in the past. Charity, the world has a, has a skewed understanding of the word charity. And at least it's different than what the Bible teaches. Right? People today, if you, if, if you talk about charity, you're going to think of an organization that may give money or give food or clothing or something like that to people in need. Right? I mean, that, that's probably your most basic understanding of just the word charity in the world today. You have these really, really rich people who have their philanthropy and their, and their charitable organizations and they, you know, they always sound the trumpet when they give a whole bunch of money towards some charity or charitable cause or their own foundation that does all these things, right? And it's always they have their own foundation, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Boy, I'm sure that has nothing to do with tax purposes, right? That, that it's, they're just controlling how their own money gets spent tax-free or whatever, right? Like, it's a bunch of nonsense. And, and the charity, I don't want to get all too far off on that either, but the charity that the world thinks of, when you start reading 1 Corinthians 13, you're going to realize that, oh, that's not charity at all. It really isn't. I mean, even just giving a bunch of money to give clothing to people isn't by itself charity. That's not what charity is. Look at verse number one in 1 Corinthians 13. The Bible says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And that means, you know, you can know all these great languages, even an angelic, an angelic language, right? Like you just know all these languages. And he says, if I know all these, if, I, if I'm speaking with these great languages, but there's no charity in the words that I'm speaking, in the language I'm speaking, I might, it might as well just be some, some trumpet blowing, just some sounding brass, something, you know, just, just something making noise, a noisemaker. Without the charity behind the words, I'm just a noisemaker, regardless of if I know every single language on the planet and can speak them all. If there's no charity involved in what I'm speaking, it's basically good for nothing. We're going to see that same concept as he goes through multiple things here. Verse number two, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. Boy, who wouldn't want to have that? Understanding all mysteries, all knowledge, just to know these great truths. Man, that would be awesome to know that. He says, oh, I have all that. And though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains. What great faith, right? Jesus said if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, that you could say unto this mountain and be cast into the sea and it would be done, right? He says that I could have all that faith. But he said if I have not charity, I am nothing. All the mysteries, all the knowledge, all the faith to move mountains. And he says without the proper heart, without the charity, it's nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. And this is the way that commonly people would be considering, well, that's charity, right? Hey, he's giving all of his goods. He's given everything that he has just to feed the poor. Wow, what a charitable guy. What, you know, he says, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. So it's possible to give things away, to do all these great works, it's possible to do all those things and not have charity. And for that not to be charity. And then it goes on to describe what charity is. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. I mean, think about that right there with the people who claim to have all this charity towards people. They're some of the most proud people in the world. Yeah, that's right. But you know what? Charity is humble. Charity doesn't vaunt itself and lift itself up over, oh, look at how great I am. The ones that want to sound the trumpet before they give so everyone can see and you get the accolades of men so everyone knows how great I am and I gave all this money to help these people here. That is not charity. And you know what? That's going to do nothing. And a lot of these people have a works-based salvation mentality and they think that oh, all these great things that I did, they're going to come back to me one day when I, you know, when I pass on. It's, uh, no. You, had, you didn't have charity and it's good for nothing. All the stuff you thought was, it was good for, it's not good for anything. Uh, it says, doth, verse 5, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own. 
It's not all about you. It truly is about the others. So when you're doing things that would be considered charitable, when you're doing things to help other people, it really is about them. In no way is it about you. You're not seeking yourself and your own glory and your own things first. You truly have the heart to seek the other person's benefit. Um, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Verse 6, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So it brings up again these, these, these real great gifts and things uh, that are spiritual prophecies, tongues, knowledge. Like it's all great stuff. But it, it's saying that charity never fails. All those things, they may come and go. The languages comes and goes. The knowledge will come and go, right? But the charity never fails. And then at verse number 13, it says, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Charity holds a, a high regard in Scripture and, and a kind of a high level of spirituality in an individual's uh, spiritual walk with God. Turn if you go to Colossians chapter 3. Or actually... Yeah, you know what? Go ahead. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. I wasn't going to go too far in depth on this, but it is important to note that Jesus is making a mention that they have charity. This church has charity. And you'll see, like, 1 Corinthians 13 is commonly quoted at weddings and things like that. And they always use uh, modern versions that are not the King James Version, which just uses the word love. Now, charity is love. but I th I, The way that charity is used, though, it is, it is a very specific and unique type of love, right? It's, it's not that the word love in general is just completely wrong, but when we have a language that's able to, to separate words into having these different meanings. Charity has a root word that has to do with like caring and thinking of other people. You could say, well, love does too. It does. But there's, love is more broad, right? And it's, it's not as specific, especially the common usage of the word. So um, charity is the proper word that has to do with, with really that, that thought of, um, you know, loving people and putting them before you. That the mind of Christ is that is that charitable mind. Colossians three, look at verse number twelve. The Bible reads, "Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye." Verse 14 says, And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So, I mean, there's a lot of things written there with uh, your, your humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, bowness. And a lot of these cross over as attributes of charity anyways, but above all of these things, it just says, you know, put on charity. And that is the bond of perfectness. So, very important aspect of your, of your Christian life is to have charity. And this church at Thyatira, the first thing he mentions of their works is, you guys got charity. And that's a great thing. They have charity. They have service, which means they're serving other people. They're, they're doing ministry work where they're supposed to, exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Having the right charity, having the right attitude, and serving other people, and faith, and patience. Patience means they're able to endure. They're able to endure hard times and go through a lot, and that works. And the last thing, so this church is doing a lot. There's a lot of things going on here, and with the right heart and the right attitude. But we're going to get to the point to where, where there's a huge problem within the church. And it's basically this one thing is the problem. But it's, it's that big of a I mean, think about, like, if it wasn't for Jezebel, this would be one of those great churches, I, I bet, that Jesus wouldn't have anything else to say negative about because of the things that it mentions here. The charity, service, faith, pay, like 
Those are all really good attributes to have in a church. Really good attributes to have. I mean, a church that really cares about people. Genuine, real, not fake, not, not uh, hypocritical, but like seriously doing service and work and ministry work because they love people and care about them. That is a great church to be a part of with people in it. But, verse 20 in Revelation 2, and turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, 20 says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, excuse me, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So there's three things mentioned in that verse that she's doing. And the fornication is what gets the most attention in the passage. But there are three things listed that she's doing. She's committing fornication and seducing the servants to commit fornication. She's eating things, sacrificed unto idols, which was also brought up this morning uh, in that service. But I, I thought it's funny because when I was preaching this morning, I was thinking like, how did I not get my notes on eating things offered unto idols? they're in my notes for tonight. So there's this, this problem that was going on with Balaam as well as with Jezebel here um, on eating things offered on idols. We're going to go through that a little bit tonight. And I was like, I know I, I know I prepared for this, but where is it? And then, uh, so there's those two things. And then to teach. So that she's a woman teaching in the church. And we're going to see that that is completely uh, un- Biblical and unscriptural. I do turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 8. The Bible reads, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So, here we see a little bit of um, the attributes of a godly woman in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. And you're going to see this consistently throughout Scripture. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time going through the various Scriptures on gender roles. We've done that plenty of times in the past. But it is very clear in Scripture that men and women have different roles assigned to them by God and characteristically, naturally have been designed differently as well. And you're a fool if you can't see that. But it's evident, it's self-evident for anyone, even if you don't believe the Bible, that you have been created differently as men and women. Um, but one of the things here, or the, the list of things in verse number nine that are mentioned about women is that they're to be dressed modestly. Now, when you're dressed modestly, you're not drawing attention to yourself. And then the rest of that verse continues to go along with attributes of not drawing attention to yourself. Shamefacedness, sobriety, you're serious. Not with broided hair, gold, pearls, costly. All of those things, the, the specially broided hair, the gold, the pearls, the costly, all of that is going to draw eyes to you which means that's immodest because you're getting people to look. It doesn't mean they're lusting after you necessarily. It just means you're getting all of the attention, focus, and everybody look at me by all of these different things. So since God doesn't want women to be doing that and to have that, that, you know, those attributes of getting everyone to look at them, it makes sense that they're not going to be the teachers and the leaders in church because he never tells the men not to wear, you know, the gold, the pearls, the caustic. I mean, men don't do that really anyways, but that's not something that is, that is told for men not to do that. I mean, obviously we know God's giving instruction to men and women to help deal with areas, I think, that are more common struggles with dealing with just in general based on their nature. And God will guide us, men and women, in, in the ways so that we're not getting too wrapped up in things that naturally may draw us into sin. But um, at the same time, that, that concept of not being like, because it wouldn't make sense if God wanted women to be the center of attention for teaching, for all these other things in front of the whole church, then it would be kind of contradictory to not, to not have, be the center. You know what I'm saying? Like not be a center of attention, but then you are a center of attention. So 
he follows that up, and that's why I think it's not a mistake, or not, um, it's definitely not a mistake, but not a coincidence that you see the description of women, how they adorn themselves, following that up verse number 11, saying, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And this is one of those passages, you know, it's not popular today. I don't know how many, you know, what, how many generations it has been popular in. I don't know if it's ever been popular. Maybe it has, maybe it has. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's never been popular, but it's what the Bible says. This is one of those passages that people want to try to make the Bible say something it doesn't say. But my friends, we have to be, you know, consistent and, and um, have good integrity when it comes to dealing with the Word of God. If it's what it says, then let's just take it for what it is and not judge God as, as being, you know, wrong or bad or something like that we need to if we think if we have any problems with what the bible is saying there we need to change ourselves not try to change the word of god or change the bible so the bible says let the woman learn in silence with all subjection well you know what that follows the rest of teaching on scripture with men and women roles and that that's the way the things ought to be done which also makes perfect sense because in revelation you've got a church that's allowing a woman to teach. Now, notice in Revelation 2.20, it says that, that it uses these specific words that, it's, that thou sufferest that woman Jezebel to teach. And in verse 12 of 1 Timothy 2, it says, but I suffer not a woman to teach. I mean, it's, it's literally almost identical language of suffering, meaning allowing, he says, you're allowing that woman Jezebel, and she calls herself a prophetess, which some tells me God doesn't consider her a prophetess because she's calling herself a prophetess, saying, well, I'm a preacher, right? And you're allowing her to get up and to teach. But the Bible clearly says, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in Silence, And then it gives a little bit of an explanation here in verse 13. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So when Adam and Eve were in, found in sin by eating of the forbidden fruit, Eve was the one who was tricked by the Satan. Adam was not deceived. Now, Adam sinned, but he was not deceived. He knew what he was doing. And he knew it was wrong, but it was after his wife already did. You know, you could go into the motivations behind why Adam did what he did. Not going to do that tonight. But Eve was deceived by Satan. He tricked her and got her to question God's word and think, oh, yeah, well, maybe, you know, this does look pretty good and everything else. And she was tricked by Satan and ended up being deceived. And it says, but Adam was not deceived. And this description is saying why women are not uh, allowed to teach, but are commanded to be in silence. So um, that tells me that women are more susceptible to false teaching, which if you're more susceptible to false teaching, then you shouldn't be the one teaching. And the Bible says in uh, al along similar lines in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, you know, if you only had one verse in the Bible that said something along these lines, you may, it may be easier for you to try to say, well, that must mean something a little bit different or not quite as strong or whatever, right? But you've got multiple places. You've got multiple witnesses in Scripture. And they're all describing the same thing. And it is what it is. And this isn't something to be upset about. Just accept the way that God allowed it. And you know what? If, if God's saying it's a shame, then you know what's a shame. Just like any other things that you consider to be a shame, 
Let's stay away from shameful things and do things God's way. God obviously has a reason. And here's the thing. Even if you don't agree with or don't understand the reasons why God has things the way they are, you're going to do, it would be, be really wise for you to accept that you may not know, but it's still true because it's coming from God, because it's God's word that's saying this. Just as my children don't always understand the reasons why I give them certain rules and tell them certain things and why some things are shame and some things aren't or whatever, they don't have to understand all the reasons, but it's still true. And I know what's best for them. And if they know what's best for them, they'll listen to their parents. Right? Because we are looking out for them. And it's the same thing with God and his word. You may not understand or agree with it. Say, well, I don't see why that. It couldn't be clearer. Let me just say that. There's some things in the Bible that that I feel don't always seem very clear, this is not one of them. The idea of having women come up and teach and preach in church, this is extremely clear in Scripture. How else do you interpret, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak? It's not permitted. And you know, people who want to try to pick this apart say, oh, well, so I guess they can't sing in church then, right? No, because what's followed up with, it says, and if they will learn anything, the learning time is the preaching time. It's when we're going through the Bible and the Bible's being preached. And you know, oftentimes you're going to hear men say, amen. Right? When things are being preached, someone will say, amen, that's good, that's right. They're giving their support. They're giving their agreement. They're expressing, hey, this is right. And confirming the words that are being preached by the preacher, you know, that confirmation is still part of the teaching. Because you're given a, yep, that's exactly right. You don't have to restate the same exact thing just to say that that's right. And even that helps everyone else listening, especially when there's hard preaching going on. I'll tell you this, when, when people start to hear, you know, you because... I know the thought process. You get a visitor come in or someone comes in or someone who's never heard this before and they hear so just like blown away and they're just thinking like, like the pastor's nuts, <laughs> right? Because he's just saying all this crazy stuff and they're looking around and like when nobody's agreeing and no one's saying amen, right? They're just going to think like, like who is this guy? This, you know, and and that, that they're like, that everyone else is on board with you. But when there's the amens, that's right, and everything else going on, especially during the harder sermons, people are going to be like, oh, it's not, I mean, this is, then they might just think, like, you guys are all a bunch of weirdos or whatever. <laughs> but at least they're going to know that they're not, like, in the majority or something, that they're going to know that this is, no, this is actually truth, and there are people who agree with this, that this is what's, this is what's right. But that's not the place uh, for women to be doing that either in church because they're commanded not to speak and to be in silence. And on top of that, it says if a woman will learn, if they'll learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. And this is also why I, because of this verse particularly, when, um, when married women have questions, they want to learn about something, I'll defer to the husband. And married women, if you're married, you should be asking your husband, if you don't understand something about the Bible, you should be asking him what the truth is on that matter. Because he is your spiritual leader. That is whom God appointed to be your spiritual leader in the home is your husband. Now, if your husband can't answer that, he will decide if he wants to go to the pastor or go to someone else to seek counsel, to be able to provide the answer for you, but you do not decide to go and seek the counsel from someone else. So the way that I handle things here is that if there is a and look, there's nothing wrong with wanting to know that. And usually when people ask, it's, you know, people ask out of ignorance or they just kind of don't know. And they just want to know the answer to things. So they just ask questions. But um, I always at least get the husband, you know, make sure that the husband's there and, and make, you know, like, well, do you want to, you know, I'm not just going to sit here and teach one-on-one -on -one your wife something when that's your responsibility. Right. And the Bible's saying, let them ask their husbands at home. That's what it says. 
It says, let them ask him at home. <laughs> you know, it's, not, it's a shame for them to speak in the church. So that is what we, um, you know, we practice here because it's what the Bible says. Now, obviously, there's a big problem when you have a woman calling herself a prophetess and getting up and teaching. It's going against clear scripture. Of course, in 1 Timothy, if you're in, in chapter 2 still, chapter 3 goes through the qualifications of a bishop. And it says in verse 1, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Right off, listing a man. But on top of that, verse 2 says, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. So how, is a, how is a woman going to be the, the husband of one wife? I mean, these days you got all kinds of crazy things going on, right? I wouldn't put it past anyone, but um, obviously this implies you have to be a male. You have to, in order to be a husband, you have to be a man. To be a husband of one wife. And I don't care what this crazy world says. I'm sticking to that. I'm not going to gonna get caught up in this double speak and double think and all the other nonsense that's going on with uh, people calling evil good and good evil and everything. Amen. We're going to stick with what the Bible says. And in order for someone to be a bishop and have that office, they need to be a man. They need to be a husband of one wife and then meet all these other qualifications as well. Um, but even if you're not the bishop, you know, women are to learn in silence with all subjection. And it's that simple. So let's move on from that subject. I, I mean, I think this is real clear. I don't even think I need to go anywhere else in Scripture. But this is one of the things that's being called out. Um, you know, women can be more susceptible to false doctrine, which is one of the reasons why they're not called to teach uh, in the church. And that's just one of the reasons given why it's the way it is. But even if you don't understand that, it's, it is what it is. Um, and if we're going to be a biblical church, a scriptural church, and, and have Jesus Christ as the head of the church, then we're going to better listen to, to what God has to say on these matters. Right. Thyatira had a problem with that. And they were too uh, allowing or permissive to allow her, just because she called herself a prophetess, to get up and to teach. And not only did she teach, but she seduced other people in the church to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So here we have a woman, preacher, and she's teaching false doctrine. Surprise, surprise, right? And it says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. So God is actually being long suffering still. And this also will demonstrate the, the, how long-suffering God is. When we look at some of these different problems that churches have, and some of them being real... I mean, you have a woman teaching and seducing people in church to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed on idols, and God is still giving space to repent. Like, to me, like, like just if that were to happen, I'd be, I'd be just freaking out if I knew, like, that was going on in a church I attended, and there was, like, some... Some woman seducing people to do this? You know, it's like, God is going to rain down on you. Especially, I mean, real believers, not some fake church somewhere that's, that, you know, they got some false gospel. But I mean, a real church, like, like I'd be scared to death. Like, what is God going to do here? But it's still, he was, he's giving space to repent. It says, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her in a great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Now, I'm going to get into the rest later because I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to I bring up the eating things sacrificed unto idols. Actually, it's interesting because I had a question even this morning about this. And I wanted to answer this because maybe this isn't covered enough or well enough. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So, obviously, it's very well established that we shouldn't be suffering women to teach in a church. And she calls herself a prophet. That's wrong. We're going to look at her doctrine of teaching people to eat things sacrificed unto idols, which also uh, we saw earlier this morning, but I didn't go into detail about that with the doctrine of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, right? And they were, they were teaching people to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And there's a teaching going on today, and I actually just had a comment on our YouTube channel about it recently. So, some stupid mocking comment. Like, oh, 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 don't you know, you know, I'm saying, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. But, and I don't care about those comments, but it's like, 
there's that, it, I know where it's coming from. It's coming from this false teaching that says that really it's not a sin to eat things sacrificed on idols, that it's not a big deal and it's no problem in the New Testament. And that's false. Okay, now I'm going to explain a little bit just as the scripture does. But it's being brought up here. We saw it in the last two churches teaching people to eat things sacrificed on idols as a bad thing, as something that Jesus has against them. That alone should bring up the red flags of someone who wants to say, well, we could eat things sacrificed unto idols. Then why would Jesus have a problem with it if you can do it, if it's not a problem, if it's not sinful? Why would he have a problem with it? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. It's also mentioned in 1 Corinthians 10, but I'm not going to go into detail in chapter 10. I'm just going to look at chapter 8 tonight. Verse number 1, the Bible reads, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. For though there be many, but for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So he's saying, first of all, you know, these, this food that's offered unto idols, we know that an idol literally is nothing. We know that there's only one God. So when people have these ideas and these statues and idols and they're thinking like this is God and they're offering up this, this, you know, this food and sacrifice up, we know it's a bunch of nonsense. We know that it's just gold and silver and wood and whatever, stone, like whatever you may have, that it's lifeless. And meaning, and like, there's really just nothing to it. Okay? We know that. But it says in verse 7, Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. But not everybody knows that. Some people actually think it's real. So we know that it's false, but not everybody knows that, which actually matters how we should be behaving with things. That actually should impact our behavior and what we do. And it also impacts what's sinful, not what's not sinful, because not everyone has that knowledge. Because they exist and because people give credence to this, it influences what's right and what's wrong. So, howbeit there's not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol, unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. So you can't just stop at this verse and build your doctrine right here and say, well, meat, meat commended us not to God, so it doesn't really matter if we eat or if we don't eat is what he's saying, that uh, it's not that big of a deal. It says in verse 9, but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Because, yes, at the end of the day, we know that the idol is nothing, so if we're just eating food, I mean, we're just eating food, like whatever. But, let's keep reading. Verse 10, For if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? So he's saying, well, when somebody sees you Eating that meat, that they, they, know, they know has been offered unto idols. That's going to embolden them to then do the same thing. And you don't know that person may actually think the idol is something. And here's this Christian guy that's just, he's eating it up. He's got no problems with it being sacrificed and, unto their idol. And now you're going to impact this person and embolden them to, um, to eat those things which are offered to idols. Verse 11 says, and, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so, so now look at this. So when you eat, what this is saying is when you eat things offered unto the idols, when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience because they witness you 
eating of the idol and they think that, oh, this is good, this is okay, this is fine to do this, even though it's offered on idols, he says, when you sin against them, you sin against Christ. So is it a sin to eat things offered on the idols? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. And you know what? Let's go ahead and turn to chapter 10. You're in chapter 8 anyways. I just want to point this out. In chapter 10, it talks about the Lord's Supper. Let's start reading in, uh, let's look at, look at verse number 19. I don't want to take up too much time with this either, but um, it says, What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? Verse 20, chapter 10, verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. So you're saying when the Gentiles are offering up their meat offerings and their stuff to these idols, they're actually offering them up to devils. And he's saying, when you eat what you have offered up, it's to the Lord. When you take of the Lord's Supper, that is what, you know, you're take, partaking of Christ's body and you can't mix the Lord's cup with the cup of devils. You can't mix the two together and be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Verse 22 says, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. So what's happening here is that on the one hand, it's lawful for you. You're free in Christ. We know the idol's nothing. Food is food. You, you know, like eating the food doesn't really do anything as far as just consuming food. There's not some hex on the food that's like poisonous or anything different about the food is the food is the food. Someone waves their little hand in the air and does some ritual. It doesn't change the food, right? And in that sense, hey, man, we're at liberty to eat because there's food here and I'm going to give God thanks for blessing me with food. But because other people consider that a holy thing to these other gods and everything else, that's what makes it a sin for you. The food itself, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, you could just as easily eat it and, it, and you know in your mind and you have the knowledge that that idol's nothing and it's just stupid and they're doing some stupid hocus pocus. I'm just going to eat my food because it's no big deal about eating that food and I'm just going to give God thanks for it, right? I have the liberty to do that. But because of everybody else you don't have the liberty to do that because then you're gonna, you could defile their weak conscience and cause sin upon them, which in so doing, you're sinning against Christ. That's, that's what, how this doctrine plays out. That's what's being taught in Scripture. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. He says, uh, you know, all things are lawful unto me, all things are not expedient, all things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Verse 25 says, Whatsoever is sold in the shambles that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judge of another man's conscience? So basically what he's saying, go ahead and go out to the meat market and you know what? Buy whatever food you want and eat it. And you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to do diligent inquisition and be like, is this kosher? Right? You don't have to look for the label and see, was it, what, did you do any sacrifices? Did you do any special rituals? Did you do anything on the idols when you're going to buy your food? So don't worry about it. Because it's not a big deal. And you know what? If someone, bid, some unbeliever bids you to a feast and they believe some weird false religion or whatever, you know what? Just go. If they just serve you food, you don't have to ask a bunch of questions. Hey, did you sacrifice this under an idol? Just eat what's put before you. Because the actual eating of the food itself is not a big deal. Right? And we know, like I said, we know the, 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 that, it's, that the idol is nothing. But when someone brings it up to you and says, this is, this is offered sacrifice to idols, at that point, it would be sinful for you to say, oh, okay, well, give it to me. I'm going to eat it. Because of that person. 
That's how it plays out. You can't just look at one verse or two verses and just be like, oh, see, look, it doesn't mean anything. Read all of it. Read all the areas, and, it, and it'll give you the full picture of what it is. And, it, and, you know, it's in our society, this isn't even that big of a deal because there's really not many people in the United States of America that are offering things unto idols. But in other parts of the world, this is a big thing. You know, there's other Eastern religions where they are, they are literally having their, their, their offerings and sacrifices up to these idols. But here, it, you don't really encounter it very much. And I don't know, I think even if there's restaurants that do that type of thing, you probably wouldn't know it, which is fine for us. Because we don't have to, this is exactly what I'm saying, you don't have to go and ask a bunch of questions and, and figure out, like, did you do this or not? Doesn't matter. It's not unless they say, hey, I offered this unto Baal. <laughs> or whatever, right? Like, be like, okay, no thanks, sir. I don't have anything to do with that. And you know what? That makes sense, too. But this woman, Jezebel, she was teaching for people to, to eat things sacrificed on idols. And you know what? You got, I don't want that doctrine creeping in here either because you know what? We've seen that twice now where people must be teaching it's okay to eat things that are just offered and sacrificed on the idols. Obviously, it's not okay. And it's mentioned to two different churches that they're allowing that to happen and God's angry about it and they're about to lose their candlestick. So we covered that doctrine. Let's um, continue on here because, the, the, and still, the, the one that gets the most attention and rightfully so is this, fornic this woman who's not only teaching but then is, is committing this fornication in a church. Fornication is a really horrible, filthy, wicked sin that has no place in church. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says, you know, that, that if, if, if someone's called a brother is a fornicator, that they're to be ca cast out of the church. I mean, they're, you're out. It's a serious sin. And one of the things I found, in, if multiple things I found interesting here, is that God said he's going to, Jesus says, you know, them that commit adultery with her in a great tribulation, they're going to get, they're going to start going through a lot of hard times and unless they repent. And then not only that, verse 23 in Revelation 2 says, and I will kill her children with death. Like, this is serious. He said, I'm going to go and kill her children. Like, they're just going to die. And it says, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. We're saying, this is, I mean, that fornication, don't play around with that. He's like, her kids are going to die. If she doesn't stop this, I've given her space to repent. If she doesn't stop this, her children will die. And then he says in verse 24, But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. Not knowing, you know, he's saying, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill her children. They're going to suffer great tribulation to people who are actually doing this in the church, and I'm going to try them according to works. But the rest of you, he's basically saying, I'm not going to burden you with anything else. But I know when he says, the rest of you, you don't have this doctrine and have not known the depths of Satan. The imagery that, that, that conjures up, you know, the depths of Satan, how, how bad of, uh, into sin and backsliding can you get to where you're just like at the depths of Satan? That, that's... That's what fornication is. I mean, that's knowing the depths of Satan. Well, let's look, we're going to look at some of the Proverbs that talk about fornication and why it's being referred to here and why I'm saying it's the fornication part that's being referred to as the depths of Satan. Like, that is really low and really bad. And I hope, you know, everybody listens, but especially, you know, younger people, who may find themselves more likely to be in a situation to commit fornication, get some knowledge and some understanding tonight and some wisdom. Take this strong language seriously. It's not a joke. It's not something that's just, oh, parent just trying to scare me. The reason why I'm trying to be scared about this is because it really is bad. I mean, it, because it's true. Okay? 
Some people complain like, oh, you're, you're giving the gospel to people. Well, you're scaring them with hell. Well, you know what? Hell is a scary place and it exists and it's real and people are going to go there if they don't believe on Jesus Christ, okay? So it's not just this fear tactic just to make people do something I want them to do. It's telling people the truth. When we're talking about fornication, it's the same thing, okay? Fornication destroys lives and oftentimes just leads to death. Okay, and, it's good, and if you don't want to know the depths of Satan and how bad things can really get, then don't mess with fornication. It's a serious sin. Turn, if you would, to the book of Proverbs. We're going to start off in Proverbs chapter 2. This wording in this imagery is used over and over again about fornication. Proverbs 2, verse number 16, the Bible reads, To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Now, why is she strange? Because they're not married. Because it's someone that you don't know. It's just some other woman. Which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. Verse 18, look at this. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. It's a serious warning about going in unto the strange woman, the woman that you don't know, and going and committing fornicating, fornication with because her house leads to death and her paths unto the dead. When I talk about getting to the depths of Satan, how about a house that inclines unto death? Proverbs chapter 5, look at verse number 3. Proverbs 5, verse number 3. For the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. Sounds great, right? But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. This is the end of the strange woman. Now look, yes, in every instance we're going to be looking at the strange woman, but don't think that this, the fornication is only the man committing fornication with the woman as being like the man receiving bad from this, it, it, apply this both ways, okay? Because this will apply both ways. Chapter 7, Proverbs chapter 7. Verse number 21, the Bible reads, With her much fair speech she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Decline, you're going down to her ways, right? The depths of Satan. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Look at verse 27. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. So in Proverbs 2, 18, we have her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead. Proverbs 5, 5 says her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Proverbs 7, 27 says her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. This is the references to fornication that the Bible is trying to warn you about and tell you about, look, don't get into the depths of Satan and knowing how deep that path goes because it leads to death and hell and destruction. Stay away. Flee fornication. The Bible says flee fornication. Stay far away from it. There are a lot of sins that can be committed and, and you know, we have a tendency to think that, you know, certain sins or whatever are not bad. I don't care how much fornication is going on around you. It is, it is, not, it is not a light thing. It is not a small thing. It is a big, big deal. I mean, God's ready to kill this woman's children. You're ready to kill her children. You want to hurt someone real bad, you know, sometimes there are things worse than just losing your own life. For a mother to lose her children's life, 
I bet every mother in here would say, I would rather die than have my children killed and me survive. If there was a choice in that matter. That's where fornication leads. That type of judgment. You don't want that. You have a choice. Jezebel had a choice. She has a choice. I mean, it, she's dead now. <laughs> Who knows where she is? But she had a choice. And God gave, and God gave her opportunity to, to repent, to stop, not to do that. And he warned everyone else in the church. He said, you know what? You guys got a lot going on in there, and I'm not going to lay any other burden on you. You haven't known the depths of Satan like these people have. But all the people, not just Jezebel too, because it was those also that were committing adultery with her were also going to be judged. You know, I'm going to judge all of them according to their works. Kind of crazy to think that that could even be going on in a church that had all those good attributes. But it was. It was. I've come to find out some, unfortunately, things after the fact of stuff that was going on in, in church in Arizona that I pastored before coming here. Had no idea what was going on. You know, it was a great church. A lot of people that love God and were you know, interested in going out soul winning. And, and, you know, very similar to this church. Just it wasn't as big. But... Yeah, it turned out, you know, I uncovered, came to light, real serious sins going on. Didn't know it. I would have liked to get a letter like this. <laughs> not that you want, not that you ever want to get bad news, but you know what? I'd much, if there's something I can deal with and do something about, then I definitely want to get it. I want to know about it, right? Now, this was out in the open. I mean, Jezebel's this this prophetess who knows how much was known about the fornication and stuff from the elder i don't know but she never should have been you know behind the pulpit to begin with teaching the church because that's clear from scripture that never should have been allowed to happen and then he says in, in revelation 225 but that which you have already hold fast till i come don't let those good attributes that you have slip away hold on to those things the good attributes that we have as a church, we want to hold on to those things. We want to hold fast. Hold tight to those things and let's add more good things and get rid of the bad things. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all these instructions that are given to these various churches. Lord, I pray that you please help us to, to improve within our own church and that you would help us to keep good doctrine and teach us good doctrine, dear Lord, that... Um, we could not be um, failures and that we, we, we could continue just to do good works for you and that if you judged us according to our works that we would, you'd not have anything uh, negative to say about us but just to encourage us to keep going. Lord, help us to do more works for you and just to grow as a church. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.